Okay, so you got a couple handouts today. Um, one is exercise 106, which of course we'll go through uh, in detail today. Uh, the next is your assignment 102, uh, which obviously you're turning in assignment 101 today. We move on to assignment 102. And this is where we bend the reality of, of everyday life a bit um, using Photoshop. And so we'll start today learning the skills that you need to be able to execute this kind of an assignment. Um, and so it's not, at this point, it's not something to panic about just yet. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's good to, for you to see this and know kind of where we're going. Um, you can see an example here. You can also look at a bunch of examples that have been done on the course website. Um, next Wednesday, I will um, show you a bunch of examples that people have done before and talk about what's successful and what's not successful about those examples, which will certainly help. Um, you guys all remember that Monday's a holiday, okay? So congratulations, you don't have to be here on Monday, right? If you show up, that's great, but I won't be here either. So um, enjoy your enjoy your holiday. Um, one of the things that's nice about the spring semester is we have a few scattered holidays as we go through. We have spring break kind of in the middle. Somehow the fall all crams together, and then we have Thanksgiving, and then it's panic because you're almost done and whatever. So the spring tends to work nicely in terms of the way the breaks go. Um, so. Like I said, I scheduled uh, assignment 101 to be due today so that you didn't have to worry about it over break. And then we'll talk about this one a little bit more in depth when you guys get back after break. So today we're going to talk about two things. And in prior uh, classes, I separated what I'm going to talk about into two lectures, but I'm actually condensing in the beginning a little bit so we have a little bit more time at the end to go through some stuff that we ran out of time prior to. Um, so today we're going to talk about both high dynamic range photography and panoramic photography. And the truth is that the two of them do kind of go hand in hand anyway. Um, so we'll talk about both. We'll start in the, in the world of uh, high dynamic range photography, also known as HDR photography. If you've taken uh, 136, you'll, you'll know the term HDRI because uh, we use that quite frequently. If you haven't yet, um, you will learn it when you take 136. Um, but it, it is based on uh, basically a set of techniques that allow a greater dynamic range of the image um, between the lightest and darkest areas of the image. And so we have um, two photographs side by side here, split down the center. This one being kind of what we would standard get out of a photograph, and this being the high dynamic range photograph that is the same photograph. So you can see that we get the sunset, we get the shadows, but we also get the grass where on something like this, we're losing it all. We get one or the other. Uh, and the truth is, the reason we do that, this is another example of high dynamic range. There's going to be lots of examples today. I think there's like 80-something slides because I couldn't pick out example. You know, I, I like too many of the examples, so there's just going to be a lot of pictures. So um, basically, what we're trying to do is we're trying to accu accu accurately represent the various light intensity levels that we see naturally in our eyes. Okay? So if we sit here, for example, and everybody, quick, look outside. Right? When you do that, your eyes see everything that's outside. We see all the detail. We see the bright spots. It's no big deal. And then immediately shift back and look down low at the shadows in this room, or, right? or look into that uh, hallway that's dark. Your eyes still adjust really quick, and we see all the shadows. Right? Obviously, as we get older, our eyes don't adjust quite so fast, right? and you may experience delays. If you go from really bright to really dark, your eyes don't quite adjust as fast as they used to. Uh, but the truth is that our eyes are incredibly quick, and our brains are great at processing dynamic range. So we actually see in high dynamic range. Right? So we can see outside. We can see the bright spots. We can switch our gaze back. We can see the dark spots. We can see the detail uh, from within a room. When we take a picture, however, right, we're stuck at a particular exposure level. Right? So we can expose for outside so that we can see everything that's outside. But when we do that, everything that's inside here becomes too dark. Right? We can expose for inside. And when we do that, everything outside becomes too bright. Right? It's like take, trying to take a picture inside a, a room and get both what it looks like outside and what it looks like inside. You know, our eyes can see it, but we can't actually photograph it. The other purpose of a high dynamic range image is Something that you guys will experience a lot in 136 when we start to get into rendering and V-Ray and that sort of thing, because high dynamic range images are used as background environments for rendering engines. 
And so if we, if we take V-Ray and Rhino for the example, I know you guys aren't in that class just yet, but you will be. Uh, well, a couple of you are in that class. But when you experience this, what happens is when you do a rendering, you have control over how the scene is exposed, what shutter speed, right? as if you were taking a picture with a camera. Well, the computer and the rendering engine needs to be able to predict what the background looks like based on whatever your camera settings are. So our backgrounds are actually high dynamic range images that will adjust depending on what our settings are. Um, so it's a very powerful use of this um, type of photography that you will end up in uh, using quite a bit as we go forward. So the truth is that a high dynamic range image by itself doesn't actually show us what the scene looks like as if our eyes were looking at it. We have to apply something called tone mapping on top of the image to make it so that the final image looks like what we see in a particular scene. Uh, and so what this does is it reduces the overall contrast to facilitate a display of the high dynamic range right, within a lower dynamic range device. That could be your monitor, it could be a print, um, it could be the projector. Right? All of those aren't capable of, of showing us high dynamic range, so we need to somehow strip down this complicated image into something that we can see. Right? It can produce images that look the way the scene looked. It can also produce images that are far beyond what the scene looked like. They can get more into the artistic realm than anything else. So what it does is it reduces the dynamic range or contrast ratio of the entire image while retaining localized contrast. So what we're doing is we're selectively adjusting certain parts of the image. So if we look in the shadows, we're adjusting the shadows so that within the shadow we can see light and dark. And if we look at the highlights, we're adjusting the highlights so we can see light and dark. So we're taking each region of the image and adjusting it differently, as opposed to applying programmatic changes to the whole image. Right? So it's small scale adjustments. So we have two primary software choices to do this. Uh, the first software choice, no, pro no, no surprise, is Photoshop. Right? And so in order to do this, we're going to take a, fuse, a fusion of three images. I ask you to try to do this on your own images. If you don't, I have sample images that you'll be able to play with today um, to, to make sure that you can do this. We're going to take three images so that we have uh, information in the shadows, information that is correctly exposed, and information uh, that is overexposed. And we're going to combine those together using an automated Photoshop action. It's called Merge to HDR. And it's going to take those three images and make one image out of them. Right? Then we're going to perform some post-processing to get desired results. And we're going to use something called masking to help facilitate how this works. And masking is something we're going to use a lot in this class going forward. Unfortunately, there's no kind of automated option for this tone mapping process. We'll have to manually do the tone mapping. Uh, which is good because you learn a lot in the process, but it's not as easy as one click and, and have it look good. Uh, it is, of course, available on the lab computers or uh, on your home computers. The other software product <coughs> is called Photomatix, and it's considered to be the gold standard of tone mapping. Almost all the images that I show you that are high dynamic range images were done in Photomatix. Um, it's kind of the, the high end level. If you're going to do this work, this is what you're going to use. Um, it has plugins that work on top of Photoshop. Uh, it has plugins that work on top of uh, you know, Lightroom, or, or it also has its own standalone open the photos in that application and process. Right? It's very, very good at tone mapping, such that um, you basically click a few boxes and it makes your image look great. Right? But you have to pay for it. So there's a trade off. So let's look at some of the realistic examples and talk about why they might be relevant uh, in the world of architecture. So I have two, two images here. right? Um, I actually don't know what city this is in, uh, but it's an, it's an open floor. right? If you were trying to sell this space to somebody, right, and you went up to the space and you took a photograph, chances are your photograph would look like the top photograph, right? where you can, have, you can see everything that's going on inside, but everything that's outside, the view and everything, gets washed out. Right? This is very normal. Right? A high dynamic range version doesn't change much in the image, but it does allow us to see what's going on inside. Right? Notice that we can actually see a little bit better of what's going on in the shadows than we can at the top. But it also allows us to see what's happening outside the windows. 
right? It allows us to see what's, what's going on in the broader context, what's the view. So if you were trying to sell this, right, the high dynamic range image would be a far better choice, right, to try to showcase that um, information, right? Maybe it's uh, you're taking a photograph of a building that's at night. You're trying to get good uh, color rendering uh, of, of what's going on, what the materials look and feel like. But at the same time, you want to show all of the individual lights on. Right? A high dynamic range is a good way of doing that because you can fuse the two uh, scenes together. Maybe it might be as simple as a basic landscape scene. Okay? This looks an awful lot like a normal photo. Okay? But if it wasn't high dynamic range, things that were happening in these bushes and down in these shadows would be completely black. We wouldn't have that detail. So a little bit of high dynamic range applied to this image enhances what we can see and what we can perceive about this particular image. Right? Another example here of kind of the, the dusk scene. Right? Architects love photographing at this time because you get all of the color and everything of what the building looks like, but you also get all the lights lit up because we like lighting too. So it's this good combination. But if you try to go and, and take this photograph, it's a lot harder than it looks because you either expose for the lights, in which case the sky and the colors get washed out or, or too dark, right? or you expose for the sky and the colors and you can't really see the lights. So by doing a high dynamic range, you're taking an exposure of each and you're fusing those exposures together to make this image. Right? So it can really enhance uh, this, this time of day. Right? An image like this, and, and some of this gets washed out because of the projector, if this was a normal image, everything happening under on the underside here would be completely black. Right? You guys, unfortunately, can't see the detail as well as I can on my, on my screen. Uh, but we're actually getting detail there that we would otherwise lose as part of the high dynamic range. So remember, all these examples I'm showing you are on the realistic side of the spectrum. Right? We're not exaggerating anything. Uh, this one is pushing <coughs> exaggeration a little bit in terms of the saturation of the color. But it's still, I could imagine being in this scene and seeing a sky that looked something like that. It's, it's within reason. Um, one of the reasons I do really like this photo is it points out a few problems that tend to happen with high dynamic range images and moving objects. Right? Moving people, moving objects. So let's look right here at this car. Right? Remember, a high dynamic range image comes from a series of individual images that are put together. Well, if something moves when you're taking the photo, right, it's going to have different places in the final photo. So if we look at this car, we can see that in one frame, the license plate was here. In the next frame, the license plate was moved over by a couple feet. Right? So we get this kind of ghosting happening. We get kind of a slice through the car right here. Right? And that's a problem when we do the post-processing. We also, if we look at the people, right, some of the people are fine. But if we look at other people, they're kind of half there or they move during the process. And so we get these ghosted people, which can be a desirable effect, but it's something to be aware that does happen. Right? When you combine images together, you, have to, you run this risk, uh, certainly in a, cl in a crowded environment. Okay, something like this very traditional architectural photo. Um, without high dynamic range, this would be completely black and we wouldn't see that detail. We see the detail because of the high dynamic range. Uh, another example here, right? not the best quality of image, but detail underneath here in the shadows because of high dynamic range, but still well within the reason uh, uh, of what we're trying to do. Same thing here, uh, kind of the dramatic photo of the waterfall. Um, works fine because all the water can blur together. Right? We don't need individual droplets. That's OK. That was kind of the desired result. We get good lighting, good detail in the shadows. Uh, I would encourage you to look at this particular photo on, on the slides afterward, because it's a lot better than what you see on the, on the screen. Similar uh, in terms of strategy and what we get. Right, likewise. Like I said, I have a hard time calling out. I'm going to show you too many examples. <coughs> Another example in the shadows at the bottom here, right? We see all the detail of what's ma what makes up the patio. If it was a traditional photo, we'd lose that. Okay? Dusk, night shots, our prime example. Another example here just of, of the coastal uh, region. Right, some California sunsets. These are ones that I've taken. Um, 
trying to capture what the sunset actually looked like, right? We talked about this earlier uh, in the class where we had, um, I asked you if you had ever tried to take a picture of a sunset and it didn't look the way you thought it was, right? This is how we can approximate what's happening. OK, so let's move from the realistic examples to the creative examples. And this is where we push the boundaries a little bit. Okay, So San Francisco, right? yeah, this is, this is on the borderline of realistic and, and not realistic. But there's something about it that makes it a little bit more painterly, or a little bit, the light isn't quite truly accurate to, to being there. There's a little bit more uh, feeling in this. There's just a glow to the buildings that wouldn't normally be there. Right? We can push the boundaries a little bit further. The sky probably wasn't that black, right? But the photographer in this particular example was trying to capture this haunted house feel. So they pushed the boundaries of the high dynamic range a little bit more than they might have actually seen in the particular scene, right? Pushing into the realm of a little bit more painterly with the sky, right? Just pushing the envelope of, of what this really is doing, right? You guys have seen the Golden Gate before. Right? Chances are it doesn't really look like this. Right? But we're pushing that boundary. Right? And it's starting to become more painterly and more artistic. Uh, so this is actually a panorama. It's a 360 panorama. We'll talk about panoramas a little bit later. But it is also high dynamic range at the same time. So we've got a combination of the two. Right? Uh, the, the blue saturation is a little bit too much in this particular image. But well, it's still reasonably in the realm. Right? This one's definitely pushing too, too far beyond. The scene didn't really look like this. Right? Again, way too much of the, the mood coming across. Um, and so it's probably pushed beyond, beyond reason. Similar here. Right? The clouds are just a little bit too dark. A right? little bit too much yellow. Yeah, that could probably fall into the reason, reasonable category. OK, so let's shift into panoramic photography um, and kind of talk about this. And the two relate to one another. A lot of times, high dynamic range ends up being panoramic. What are you looking for? Yeah. Are you okay? Thank you. Appreciate that. So a panorama is any wide angle view or representation of a scene. Okay, And in the old days, you guys won't even remember this. I don't even know why I bothered to tell you this. There, there was this special camera that came out in between kind of the, the film, the traditional film camera and the, the digital camera. And it was like this, this little point and shoot that you could like convert and it would shoot panoramas instead. And you could get like long skinny prints. Uh, it was kind of cool at the time. Anyway, I'm probably dating myself. But the point is that it's a wider than normal field of view. And we now, when we carry our phones around, have the ability to take panoramas relatively easy in our phone. You guys have probably done this before, right? You start and you kind of swing the camera and it takes the, the long picture, OK? A 360 panorama is a full 360 degree view of a particular scene. So we start at one point, we go all the way around, and we come back to the same point. So what panoramic photography generally involves is it involves stitching multiple images together. Right? When we look at our phones and we swing the camera through, our phones are just dynamically stitching the images together. It's a bunch of individuals that are being stitched together. Um, we can do this kind of compositing by just taking a bunch of images and then combining them together. Right? Or we can be a little bit more controlled or a little bit more um, careful about how we take the series of images. Depending on the lens in your camera, uh, depending on um, you know, a variety of settings, it may take 100 pictures to make a panorama. If we were doing a full 360, it might take 12. Right? It may take three, depending on what kind of lens you have. And so that's going to vary. The general concept is the camera is in the center, and there's a bunch of pictures that wrap around that represent this scene. Right? So let's talk a little bit about the mechanics. And one of the things that's a, that's a telltale problem, I'm actually going to skip ahead three sides, and we'll come back. One of the, the telltale problems of panoramic images or stitching images together are things like this, right? Where we have some power lines and all of a sudden they don't line up quite right, right? Or maybe you know there's little, you've got a line that goes across the edge of the pool and, and they don't quite line up. These kinds of things are extraordinarily common, right? Here's a building 
right? Where we have part of the curve of the building doesn't quite match that curve, right? You've probably seen this happen before. What, what's happening here is something called parallax. And it has to do with how you're actually shooting the picture. And by our nature, right, if I was going to take a panoramic image, image, certainly with my phone, I'd start in one place and I'd swing around and I'd take all my pictures. Right? But the truth is that isn't isolating what's called the nodal point of the camera. Right? The nodal point is a point in the lens where the light that comes in actually inverts and goes upside down. Right? It happens in every lens. It's the same way you guys know in our eyes, right, when we see the images are actually upside down when they hit our retinas and our brains are smart enough to, to flip it over. There was a study done where somebody wore glasses. You may have heard of this, right? And it, it had mirrors in it and it flipped the, the scene upside down. And it took a person, I think, 24 hours and their brain corrected it and started seeing everything correctly again. So cool concept. Anyway, camera works the same way. It flips at this nodal point and if we understand where that nodal point is and we move around that point, we won't end up having those kinds of errors. So instead of taking the panorama like this, right, we take the panorama, camera stays in the same place, and we move around the camera. Right? You'll get much better results. It's something that's simple, but it can really enhance what's happening. So here, here's a, the kind of the, the field of view example. Uh, usually it happens with a near and a far object in the relationship of the near and the far object, right? So if I were standing here and taking a picture or a panorama, and I, were, uh, you know, I, I, was, I was trying to get you guys in focus, and as I was swinging, Jose's way in the back, right? And if I was doing that and I didn't have the isolation point uh, or the nodal point isolated when I went to swing the camera, he would move in a different position than you guys are. So here we are, right? You guys are here. Jose's back there. Okay. Here it is without isolating the nodal point right, on the camera. We're swinging the camera. And we get you in line here, and we get you out of line here. Okay. If, however, we isolate the nodal point and we rotate around that, right, the view switches from you were in the center to both of you stay in alignment, but you're on one side. Okay. So it's critical to kind of isolate that point, especially with the larger, fancier um, panoramas. So we end up with a final result. And we generally end up with two things. One can be an unrolled image, which is a processed image where we take all of these pictures that make up a, a sphere, right? And we flatten them out, and we stretch them, and we lay them flat, right? It's kind of like if you had a, um, you know, a map of, or a globe, and you peeled it off and kind of laid it flat, OK? Same concept. Or we can have a virtual reality movie, which I'm sure you've seen as well. Right, that are interactive that let you choose what to look at in a particular scene. So two different ways of looking at it, uh, both of which are available uh, to you as an end result. So a couple different software packages let us do this. The first is, of course, Photoshop. Right? I wouldn't tell you all this stuff if Photoshop didn't do it. Uh, it's, of course, available in the labs, Mac or PC, all the same stuff that I usually say. It's really, really good at small groups of images. Right? You could throw maybe 10 images at it. It'll do a great job. Okay? If you throw 50 images at it, not so good. Okay? The other thing is it loves doing like about 180 degrees. It doesn't like 360. So 180 works pretty well. Right? When you start th throwing 360 at it, it gets very confused as to where the end is and where the start is. So it's not the best for really large format, completely unrolled 360 in both directions panoramas. Uh, Stitcher was an Autodesk product. Uh, actually, it was an independent product first, and then Autodesk bought them. And it was great, because you'd take your images, and you'd drop them into this kind of interactive interface, and you'd just kind of move the image where you thought it would go, and you'd hit Enter, and it would like tweak and align and warp the image, and it would fit in place. It was awesome software. So Autodesk bought them, and the last time they updated it was in 2009. Oops. Right? It's kind of sad, because if the, the company had remained independent, we'd probably have a really good viable stitching option that's out there. Um, so and that's what happens. PT GUI is a, a really, really good, sophisticated program, uh, kind of the next level of sophistication. It's what a lot of people who do this um, for a living or as a, as a side hobby end up using. Um, you can do manual or automated picking of control points. So you can go in and say, this point in this image is that point in that image. 
and it will help warp and align the images correctly, or it will go through and actually detect similar points in the various images. Um, it has great output options. It's built on an open source platform, but it's the graphic interface for that open source platform. It tends to be well developed, uh, Mac or PC. I've stitched a lot of panoramas in PT GUI in my time. Huggin is um, another option built on the same open source software that PT GUI was built on. Uh, the difference is that this is free and open source, so you guys can all go home and download it and play around with it. Uh, it is available on these computers. I'm not going to make you do it today unless you feel like you want to try it out. Um, but I like to point out that it's available. And if, if panoramic stuff is something that's very interesting to you, um, by all means, you know, open it up and play around with it because it's a really powerful piece of software and it does great results. Um, like I said, it's built on the same thing as PT GUI. It's significantly slower at doing the processing than PT GUI is. Um, so it, there are trade-offs for the fact that it's free, but the results can be very, very good. Uh, I have stitched many successful images with it. Um, there's another app <coughs> written by Google. It's called Photosphere. Some of you may have it built into your phone. Some of you may have to download it. Uh, but it's free. Um, it's really good at stitching panoramas together kind of on the fly with your phone. It does a great job. Um, it's, Google's trying to use it in conjunction with their Street View kind of thing uh, as a way of kind of mapping the world and getting more individual perspectives of where certain things are. Um, it's really great for outdoors. Right? When things are far away from you, it does a fantastic job. You took a walk on the beach, and you take your, your, your phone out, and you take a photosphere of it, it'll look spectacular right? without you having to do much. If I instead was trying to do it in this room, right, it would have a really hard time. There's just too many things, and there's going to be too much parallax happening for the resulting image to be that good. It's kind of interesting because if you look at their sample images, <coughs> They have like some perfect interior ones. And whoever did it either used a tripod with a very specialized camera or somehow did something that I can't quite figure out and replicate. Um, so it's worth pointing out that it's great for outside, not so much for inside. So let's look at a bunch of examples. So the thing <coughs> about an unrolled panoramic image is that straight lines appear curved and curved lines appear straight in an unrolled image. Um, so it, you have to kind of shift your, your mental view a little bit. So uh, this is that place in Peru that I was talking about, Tombow, Colorado. Uh, this is a panoramic image of it. This was not the final one that I ended up um, saving, but I like this one because it shows you that you have to pay attention to exposure. Right? So I had one photo of all the, you know, I think it was 36 or 48 images that I stitched together, where I made a mistake when I shot it, and the exposure was off. And so you can see this one little line that appears on both sides. Obviously, if we were to curl it around, they would connect. Uh, that one image was off. And so when you stitch it together, it looks out of place, where the rest of the images feel like they belong together with the same exposure. So you have to be careful of exposure when you take these um, images. Another example here, um, if you don't take the full 360, right? if you, if you stop half, partway down and you stop partway up, you get these scalloped edges. Right? These are the individual photos that have been warped and stretched when it's unrolled. So you can see the bottom, each of those individual images. You could take something like this, and you could crop off the top and the bottom right, as a way of, of trying to get rid of those scalloped edges. Right? The other thing is, if you're taking photos, you want to make sure you don't miss one. Right? So here's an example. I shot this, and I missed. Now I skipped a photo, and I end up with the, the, the black hole in the sky. Now, could I go back in Photoshop and fix it? Should I clone, could I clone, clone stamp in that, that blue? Sure. right? But I like to show this as an example of you want to pay attention. Right? So I said that curve, or straight lines appear curved, and curved lines appear straight. Okay? So here's a mental challenge for you. Right? What does this look like? Right? Exactly. So this is the very center of the circles at Mirai, okay? which was an Incan development where they did crop experiments. And as you descend, each level has a different temperature. It's actually pretty cool. But anyway, so this, this last photo, whoops, go one forward, right? was taken right at the center of these circles. So every one of these perfect circles, right, when it's unrolled, becomes a straight line. Right? 
The other thing we played around with when we were there is each, you could see that there's people standing at each of the points as we go around. So this was our self-portrait on the trip, um, but it's kind of fun. Another example here, um, you, I'll, this is actually one of the ones that I'll, I'll give you as a sample to play around with um, in terms of images. It will stitch to a full 360. Um, you get great results in the interior. There's almost no parallax because the, when I took the pictures, I took a lot of time to set up the camera. So that I isolated the nodal point, et cetera. Uh, and you can end up with a very high resolution, nice um, shot. So if we look through this door, across the, the canyon to that. When we go to the next one, this photograph, oops, wrong direction, is taken from that point looking back. And I forget where, it's like right across to right about there. Right, so they're on opposite sides. Um, the horizon on this is off. Um, and you can see that the bottom is flat, the top has this wave to it. Um, that was an error in the post-processing. So just like with high dynamic range images, um, if you're in a place where people are moving, you'll get multiple exposures of those people. And as you stitch the images together, you'll get all of these ghosts that occur throughout a particular space. Um, so this was taken in the uh, Amtrak, abandoned Amtrak train station in West Oakland. Um, I took it when I was an undergrad. And this one image, I took it as a senior when I was an under undergrad, spawned my entire thesis. It was all based on this one image. Um, and so I'll show you a few examples later on. But it was all this like panoramic stuff. So I, I, I got really into it. That's why I have lots and lots of panoramic images. So this is Worcester Hall, uh, the architecture building at Berkeley. There's a exposure error. And so before, we saw the error up here in the sky. And so I could go into Photoshop and make a correction relatively easily on that. right? But the exposure error also happens across this building. It's much harder to correct the building than it is to correct this. So this ended up being just a trashed one that didn't turn out. Right? Same building, same scene at night. Right? This is more like what Worcester looks like. Right? All its lights on. It's the one building on campus that always has lights on. It's great. Uh, anyway, so this is in the courtyard in the back. Right? Another example here, this is when we were playing around with what panoramas do and how you stitch them together. Uh, so this is when we were undergrads. This was me and, and a good friend of mine. Uh, we both ended up in Peru. Uh, and so what we did is we took a panorama, and we made sure that in e every picture that we took, one of us was in the picture. So we end up in, a, in an image like this with 12 of us. Right? And so it shows you the power of the fact that when you stitch multiple images together, you can do this. So there's things like you know, you're looking at yourself, and you can set that kind of thing up, which is kind of fun. So, right? Uh, this was um, in, inside the uh, uh, Chabot Space and Science Center, kind of in the back. Uh, we were doing some laser scanning of a, a Soyuz Soviet capsule, uh, space capsule. And so while we were there, we shot some uh, panoramas. I like to point this one out uh, because there was conveniently somebody standing right here as I went around and I shot the pictures. But she was there only when I shot the lower half of the pictures. So it's just her legs that are there. And so you really have to pay attention to what's happening in the scene. You can't just blindly shoot uh, what's going on. I don't know, more stuff, randomness, right? Uh, this one was at the Brooklyn Bridge, but it was shot completely by hand. I didn't have my tripod with me. If you isolate the nodal point, though, when you go around and take your photos, chances are you can get a very good stitch. It's much harder to shoot high and shoot low. Uh, and isolate that and stitch them together. But certainly, just a standard panorama is, is relatively uh, reasonable. Right? Uh, another example here, this is out in Alameda uh, on the Naval Air Station base. Right, beach. Notice that the distortion starts to happen. Right? We've got the tree coming up. It's reasonable until we get kind of up to the top. And then as we unroll, it starts to warp funny. Right? Um, if we were looking at this in its full 360 inside an interactive panorama, it would appear straight right? because it would warp back. You can tell I like hiking. right? I think this is one of the ones that I included as a sample for you guys to play around with. 
right? You can get creative about how these things come together, you know, a little bit more on the artistic side. It just has to do with how the outputs happen. Uh, so these are a bunch of images um, from my thesis. These were all of the San Francisco airport. Um, and so if you've been there, you, you kind of recognize these sorts of things. Airports are very generic. And that was part of the reason that I needed an airport as part of my thesis. But there's, of course, lots and lots of panoramas of airports. So then it evolved into doing these drawings and these interconnectedness of spaces and whatever. It ended up doing constructed panoramas where you took architecture and then I would draw these panoramas from the architectural drawings so the plans and the sections would become these um, spherical perspectives and whatever. Uh, and so this was one of the final drawings that had the standard spherical perspective and then it had a bunch of side perspectives that were going off of it. So you can see the layered complexity of this kind of a drawing that went in as part of the thesis. Anyway, it's been a long time since I did that. I barely remember what I even wrote. <laughs> OK, so we're going to switch over. <coughs> Actually, why don't we <coughs> take about a five minute break, and then I'll switch over, and we'll go through um, merging to HDR of, of the high dynamic range images. We'll go through stitching panoramas, and then we'll talk a lot about masking and kind of advanced post-processing and controlling what parts of an image have what type of post-processing. Okay. OK, so we're going to start back up uh, with exercise 106. Um, and there's, there's kind of two big things that we're doing. Uh, one is the merge to HDR, and the other is uh, the, the merge to panoramas, or photo merge. And so we're going to do both of those operations. And then I'll go back and show you the masking. And so if we actually followed along with the way I wrote this, I tell you to do the, the HDR, and then masking, and then panorama, and then masking. But I think it's easier to explain if I do both of the, the two automated processes kind of side by side, and then we'll go into the masking. Um, so on the uh, course website today, if you go to today's exercise at the bottom, there are downloadable files for both the high dynamic range and the um, um, panoramic images. Um, and you, so if you don't feel like yours are working particularly well or you want to use some of the samples that I have, uh, they're down here at the bottom. Obviously, I haven't logged in yet, but uh, you can see that. I also have examples of the finished panoramas. Let's see if it'll actually load. Uh, how nice. It's giving us the blank. Well, it's supposed to load and be interactive, but it's, it's apparently unhappy. Um, so anyway, they're, they're there so that you can to, to work on that. And then uh, obviously, all the steps are, are isolated here. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the high dynamic range. We're going to follow this Photoshop 1.8. And that is to merge the high dynamic range images. And so on my flash drive, I actually have several sets of high dynamic range images. And uh, let me show these oops, as extra large icons so we can kind of see what they look like here. So this first set, which is a sunset, right? I have the dark scene that kind of exposes the sky. I have the mid-range scene that, that shows the water pretty well. And I have the light scene that shows the kind of the highlights. Okay? So I have three images, one, two, and three, that would work. Uh, the next set of samples are up from the top of ha half dome. I have a dark, a medium, and a light. So essentially the same thing. This last set, which you've seen the image before, I've worked with that as a sample. I have the correctly exposed, and then a dark image, and a light image. Okay? So those are the samples that I'm going to work with. I'm going to show you the process right here. I'm going to go to the File menu, and I'm going to go to Automate. So I'm not actually going to open the files yet. I'm just going to go to File, and then Automate. And right down here at the bottom, I have two options. One is Merge to HDR. right? That's the, what we're going to do first. And then the second one, when we do the panorama, will be Photo Merge. They're right next to each other. So I'll click on Merge to HDR Pro. And when I do that, it's going to say, tell me where the files are. So I'll go ahead and click Browse, and I'm going to go into my folder here for 106. And I'll pick the first three images. All right, so there's three. I held down Shift, and I clicked on the next two to be able to select them all at once. And then I'll go ahead and say OK. And it'll show me the three files. And notice at the bottom, it, there's a checkbox for Attempt to Automatically Align Source Images. So in an ideal world, when you're shooting a high dynamic range image, you would shoot on a tripod or with your camera sitting on something so that all three of the exposures are in the exact same spot. Uh, in my particular camera, um, I can enable bracketing, and it'll take three consecutive photos. So 
while they're not perfectly aligned because I don't have a tripod, it's taking three exposures, one, two, three. So they're pretty close and they tend to align really nicely. If it took you a little bit longer, right, this automatically aligned source images may or may not work. It's worth checking the box to, to try. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and say, okay. And you'll see if you watch over here in the layers, there's a bunch of stuff kind of going on, right, as this is, 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 as this is happening, okay? So then I get to <coughs> the merge to HDR Pro option here. And so if we look here uh, under preset, right, there's a bunch of presets that have been preloaded, which can be really nice. So if I was doing a city at twilight, I might want to use that preset. Okay? Obviously, if I pick that right now, it doesn't look that great for the sunset. Okay? But I can come down here, and I can look through some of the um, other examples. I can do photorealistic high contrast. I can do photorealistic low contrast. I can do photorealistic, period. Right? I could come down here, I could go to saturated. Right? So we could kind of play, a real, play around surrealistic. It's kind of interesting. Right? And I can play around with what the, the default options are. Right? I'm going to pick photorealistic because I think it's probably one of the better options. Yeah. Generally, it's three, five, or seven images, though you can feel free to use more, but it's generally an odd number because the middle image is the correctly exposed image. So you want the same number of overexposed and underexposed beyond that middle image. So it's going to be three, five, seven, or you, know, you, can, can, you can do the math, right? Nine, 11, you know, we can keep going, right? But in the mo for the most part, it's, it's usually going to be three, right? So if I come down here, right? Um, remove ghosts, right, would, would attempt to mask off um, moving objects if you had something that moved in a particular scene. It may or may not work well for you. You're welcome to try if you have an image that, that has something like that, right? And below that, we go to mode, <coughs> and then I can choose 16-bit with a local adaptation, right, uh, which seems to work out pretty well. This mode, if I did 32-bit, the end result wouldn't look very good. And we used to do, uh, in this class, we used to do a 32-bit and then convert down. The good news is this merge to HDR Pro has evolved in CS6, uh, so we can actually leave it, and it's going to create a 16-bit image, which is essentially what we can see on a computer screen. Right? I do have the ability to make some adjustments. Right? I have shadows, highlights. Um, that This preset, if I went back to the photorealistic preset here, right, it sets all of these values. But feel free to actually adjust, right? If I wanted less shadow or more shadow, you can see that just with this slider, I can control more shadow or less shadow, right? To what looks right to my eye. I can control a lighter sky or a darker sky. <coughs> I, can, I can control the saturation level, right? Lots of color or little color, depending. Uh, same thing with vibrance, right? I can control uh, what they think the vibrant setting is. And so the point is, with these sliders, you can kind of play around with what the end result is going to be to get something that looks pretty good. Okay? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go back to photorealistic, which seems to, to look pretty good to me. We can see my three exposures down here at the bottom. right? Uh, exposure value 0.00, 0, .00 exposure value of minus 1.85, and exposure value of plus 1.74 were the three pictures that I ended up taking. Right? So I'll go ahead and say, OK. And it will continue to create this HDR file, which is right here. We'll give it a little bit more time. And there it is. Okay? So just like we get to this stage of the game, now I can go ahead and I can start doing post-processing. I'm going to skip the post-processing for a second, and we'll come back to it. Okay? Uh, but I, because I want to I go through this automate option set again. So I'm going to go to File again, Automate, and I'm going to go to Merge to HDR Pro. I'm, doing, I'm repeating right now just so that you can see the process one more time. I'm going to go to Browse. And I'm going to pick three other images. Right? So I'll pick these three this time. This is from the top of Half Dome. I'll say OK. And it will start to bring those images together. There they are. And so once again, I can go through. And I could say, you know, let's do photorealistic. Right? I'm not really getting the contrast at the bottom here that I'd like. So let me play around with this. That's too much. Let me pull this down a little bit more. Right? Something like that. And then I'll go ahead and say OK, and I'll put these together. <coughs> so 
So there's the final image here. So you can see it's a relatively easy process. A few little sliders, a few presets, and we get a pretty good resulting image. Okay? Now, if I was going to stitch the panorama together, if I go to my flash drive, again, I have the folders for the panoramas already downloaded. These are the same three uh, samples that, that I put online for you to, you to be able to download. These will come down as a zip file that you'll have to extract because they're each rather large in the number of pictures. So here, for example, is the uh, Angora Peak file. And you can see that as I go through here and I look at it, right, I have a set of images that go straight around. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and oh, I repeated one image, so there should be 12 total images there. Right? Then I, I shifted the camera high, and I captured the, the sky, and I shift, shifted the camera low, and I captured low. So this whole thing would make up almost a full 360 panorama. Okay? Uh, 360 definitely around in the horizontal direction, but not quite in the vertical direction. Okay? So anyway, um, <coughs> when I'm using this in Photoshop, I'm not going to pick all of the, the pieces. I'm going to pick some samples uh, from this and stitch, you know, kind of a half of a view. And so when I go to File, Automate, Photo Merge, right, once again, I'm going to pick my images, right? Generally, under Layout, we leave it set to Auto, and then I'll go ahead and browse for my images. And I'm going to pick, let me come down here at the bottom. All right, I'm going to take this one, two, three, four. So the first four images there, the first four images of up high, and the first four images of down low. Okay, And I'll go ahead and say OK. Now, I deliberately picked just that kind of section so that you can see what happens. So uh, I'm going to attempt to blend images together. Vignetting is something that happens with some camera lenses where <coughs> the edges of the frame are a little bit darker than the center. It can be a nice artistic effect, but obviously if we're stitching it together, we don't want the edges to be darker. Um, so vignette removal is optional. Um, and geometric distortion correction, again, is optional. If, if you feel like you have darker frames, then obviously check the box. Uh, if you feel like you have some weird distortions happening, that might help. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go with it, so I'll say OK. And it's going to start to process these images. And so this is another automated process. And you can see that it's loading all the images together. And then momentarily, it's going to try to start to align the images together. And so we just, this is all Photoshop. And so we just have to be patient while it kind of works through this. The merge to HDR tends to be rather quick. The photo merge tends to take a little bit longer. So we can see that it's already starting to put these images together for me. And there we are. Looks like maybe I picked the wrong sets of images a little bit, right? Because I have this piece, I have that piece that's up above, and I have this piece that's going the wrong direction down below. So maybe I picked the wrong images. But the point is that if we look at this, I'm going to press Control plus to zoom in a little bit, we can see that Photoshop did a remarkably good job of actually stitching these images together. I can't see where the seams are <coughs> when I look at the final image. Okay? But let's take a look at what's happening over here at the layers. Okay? So in each of these layers, right, I have a photograph. And as part of that photograph, I also have it chained to what's called a mask, right, which I showed you briefly in the other class. But this is a great opportunity to kind of understand how masks work. <coughs> So let's turn all of the layers off for a second and look at this first image. 
right? And again, this was an automated process, so Photoshop decided what the mask was going to look like. Okay? So I have my image, and I have my mask. If I were to turn the mask off, I'd end up with, let me zoom out one, I'd end up with, there's my image. And obviously it's been warped a little bit, which is the process that Photoshop did, but there's my image. Now, Photoshop has assigned what's called a mask to this image to control what parts of this image are seen and what parts are not seen. Okay? And this mask is represented by this black and white square next to where the photo is. Okay? So if we interpreted this, this across the overall scene, right, everything that's black is transparent and everything that's white is opaque in the mask. Okay? We could take this a step farther. Right now it's very simple. It's just black and it's just white. If I had a, a value of gray on this mask, it would be semi-transparent. So I can control how much of it is completely opaque, how much of it is completely transparent, and how much of it is kind of semi-transparent. So as we continue on and I look at this next layer, <coughs> when I turn that on, the masks are working together. Right? Let me go back here and I'll disable these for just a second so that you can see them. Right? There's my two images as they come together, and you can see that Photoshop has kind of identified a pretty good seam for where these two images should come together. Furthermore, there's a little error in the land that's right there, and so Photoshop has adjusted for that. So when I turn on these masks, right, it's cut around where, those va where that problem area was. Okay? So now we're not seeing that problem anymore. Right? And so I have two distinct pieces that, when joined together, make this photo. So as I continue and I turn on the rest of these, right, the same process is happening right, to add these various pieces together without causing those weird artifacts. Okay? But it's based on the fact that I have these masks applied. Okay? I could manually go in and edit one of these masks right, by clicking on the mask layer itself there. I could come over to my paintbrush and I could paint with white and where I paint, or let me paint with black, excuse me, where I paint will become transparent. Right? So now that part is becoming transparent. Okay? Obviously I, I wouldn't want that, so I'll go back and I'll make it solid again. Right? Something like that. Okay? So the mask is controlling what's seen and what is not seen. Okay? But I can take masks a step further. Right, so let me come back to one of my original high dynamic range images. And I want to do something that will cause the sky to become a little bit more vibrant. Okay, so let me go ahead and I'm going to do an adjustment layer with curves. So let me go to layer, new adjustment layer, curves. And with this curves adjustment, I'm only going to work on enhancing the sky. Okay, so I'm going to drag this around until I get the sky to be a little bit deeper, something like this. Now when I do that, right, it's obviously it's affecting what's happening down here at the water too. Okay? But in this case I want it to apply to just the sky and not what's down below. Okay? So I have my mask apply, I mean I have my adjustment layer applied, but notice that I have a white square next to the adjustment layer. Okay? Because that is just like the mask that's over here, I can control where this adjustment layer is actually applying to the image itself. So I can click on the adjustment layer, okay, so that it's, it kind of has these little black brackets around it. And I can come over to my paintbrush tool. And remember, anything that I paint in black will cause it to be transparent. So the, the adjustment will not apply. So let me go ahead and paint in black, and I can paint out down here at the bottom so that the adjustment is not applying to the bottom part of the image. You guys see how that's working? Okay. Let me take it a little bit further. I'm going to change the size of my brush down. I'm going to change the hardness of my brush up. And I'm going to paint in a little bit closer right along there. Maybe right along there. Right. And now we'll see that it's really, oops, looks like I missed a little bit right in there that this is really only applying to the sky because I masked off the bottom of the adjustment layer so that it's not applying to the bottom. Okay? 
Now maybe I do, I want to go back and I want that mountain to be a little bit darker. So I can come back with the white tool. So I just use that little double-sided arrow to flip from white to black. And once again, I'll go back and be on my mask. There. And we'll paint back in the, the hills. Something like that. Let me zoom in a little bit. Right, you can see, see that green halo that's happening, right? That green halo is because my images aren't perfectly aligned. I'm going to make my brush a little bit smaller. All right, and we'll kind of fill this in here. Smaller brush. Right, maybe <coughs> that needs to be white. Something like that. Sure. Okay. So, once again, control zero. That is applying only to that part, not to the water itself. Okay. So, I'm controlling what's happening. I could do the same thing with uh, a layer blending mode. Right. So, let's say that I right click on background and I say duplicate layer. And let's say I take this and I apply a uh, overlay blending mode to it, right? That may be a little strong. Let's tone it down a little bit. Something like that, right? I can again choose where in this particular scene this is applying. Now in this case, you see that I have the layer, but I don't have a mask associated with this layer just yet. Okay? If I want there to be a mask, right? I can come down here to the Add Mask button, right? It's a it's a rectangle with a circle inside of it. And when I click on Add Layer Mask, I'll get the white square, which I can then work in. So once again, inside this white square, anything that I paint with black, let me make this a bigger brush, right? anything that I paint will have that no longer apply to it. Right? So there it is. Maybe you can see it in the center a little bit. Right? Uh, let's make a more dramatic effect. Let me go ahead and, and delete this layer altogether. Right? Let me go up to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. Let me go to Channel Mixer. I'll say OK. And I'm going to make the image black and white. And again, I would go through all of the presets to see which one gives me the best look. Okay? We'll just go with this one for right now. <coughs> okay? So in this, in this instance, this Channel Mixer layer is converting the image to black and white. Okay? If I want part of the image to be in color and part of it to be in black and white, right, I can paint on the mask in black on the areas that I want the color to be applied. So if I were to paint, for example, into the sky, right, lo and behold, the color comes back in the sky, but not, right, I'm obviously being quick with how I'm doing this, but not down in the ground or in the water. So that's remaining in the black and white realm. But what if I wanted it not to be quite so strong of color, okay? or I wanted it to kind of apply? Right? I could come in here and instead of painting in black, right, I could choose a value of gray, which remember is semi-transparent, so it's somewhat applying. And then I could paint down here, and I get a little bit of color, but not too much right, in that example. So I can control very easily what's um, being colored and what's being not uh, what's not. So on this mask I have black at the top and then gray in the middle. Okay? <coughs> so let's move forward and do this image a little bit. So let's start first. I'm gonna go to my layer, new adjustment layer, and this time I'll do a uh, levels adjustment. And I'm gonna pull my contrast down a little bit, and I'm also going to skew my overall image to be a little bit more contrasty, something like that. Okay, so that that does a nice job with the mountains, but it doesn't do a particularly good job for the sky or for the the ground in the foreground here. So I'm going to use each of these kind of independently. Okay, now let me do maybe a curves adjustment. So I'll go to layer, new adjustment layer, curves. I'll say okay. And I want to concentrate on what does 
the Fox set. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I want to concentrate a little bit more on what's happening down here in the ground and how does this ground look. Okay, so, so I have this set for the bottom here. I'll do one more adjustment for up at the top, uh, ultimately for, for making the sky look good. Okay, actually that one's not bad for the sky. So what I'll do here is I'll work first on the adjustment layer mask for the middle, right? And I'll mask off the top and the bottom. So let me go ahead and I'm going to paint with my paintbrush with black. And I'll paint the bottom so that what I'm doing isn't applying to the bottom. Whoops, that's on. That shouldn't have been included. Like that. Okay. And then I'll also paint up here at the top. So that it's not applying up top there. And I'm rushing a little bit. Okay. Then, right, we see here on my mask, I have black, white, black. Right? This adjustment layer, I want the actual opposite to happen. And so I could go in and paint out the center, right, using black like this. Right? So that that's not happening in there. Right? But the truth is, I already have, let me undo. I already have a mask here. It's the opposite of what I want, but I already have a mask. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this little square of a mask. We'll get rid of it. And then I'm going to hold down the Alt key, and I'm going to drag this mask on top of this layer. And it's going to create a copy of the mask that I have, okay, which is good. But remember, I wanted not the same mask. I wanted the, the pieces to be masked off is the center, not the, the other two. So I'm going to take the mask. And I'm going to go up to Image, Adjustments, Invert. And my mask is going to flip from being black, white, black to being white, black, white. Okay? And so I've effectively, now I have a control over two different things. One is affecting the sky and the ground. One is affecting the center of the image. Okay? So I didn't actually have to paint it twice. I just used some skills to be able to uh, apply it in both directions. Okay? So a lot of today is obviously getting the high dynamic range image processed, getting the panoramic image stitched together. But the other part of it is selectively applying some adjustments. And so if you want to do blending modes, that's fine. If you want to do curves, levels, um, those kinds of adjustments and selectively apply it, that's great. There is not a right or a wrong way of doing things. right? So if you make part of it black and white, and you make part of it and you adjust the curves, and the resulting image really doesn't look good, no big deal. right? This is about learning the skills and exploring masking. We will cover masking a lot more uh, next class, right? Or next Wednesday because we don't have class on Monday, right? Any questions? No. All right. I'll turn you loose.